Spain and Fitz, the podcast. It is that time again. It is Spain and Fitz here on ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance. I'm Matt Jones. Myron Metcalf is here. We are filling in for Spain and Fitz, ready to get you a big set of news throughout the day. Monday Night Football is coming up. Oh, yeah, it's Falcons and the Jets. I know your DVRs are set. We got the Yankees and the Mets. Myron, big night in sports after a big weekend of preseason football action. Yeah, man, and and college football is approaching, man. This is a great time of year if you are a sports fan, for sure. Week zero in college football including a matchup that America's been waiting for, Vanderbilt and Hawaii. That'll be a big (laughs) one. Should be exciting. But we're going to get to all the big news. But let's start with, well, probably the biggest star in in football. Tom Brady is back with the Bucs. Yes, he had taken 11 days off. It was a predetermined uh, time off for personal reasons. They did not say what those personal reasons were, but that's okay. He doesn't, doesn't have to say. But he's back, and that's okay. And I think the team is obviously excited about it. He began practicing. Harry Douglas is an ESPN radio host. He was on Keyshawn, J. Will, and Max, and he said, you know what? I don't care that Brady's gone. It doesn't matter. He can do what he wants. After Keyshawn won his Super Bowl there, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have been irrelevant until Tom Brady – showed up within that organization and won that organization a Super Bowl. So if Tom Brady wants to go film the Mass Singer, the hell be it. I'm fine with Tom Brady going to film the Mass Singer, even if I'm his teammate, because I know we have a Super Bowl chance when he's our quarterback. Irrelevant, which I did not know was even a, a, a word, but I like that from my guy, Harry Douglas. It's, 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 has it been assumed that he was at the Mass Singer? Is that what we're? Is that where this is all coming from? Or what? What? What are we with the Mass Singer? Bob? That's what Reddit is saying. So you know it's true. Um, apparently, conspiracy that's theory here from Amber Wilson is that there was a producer of the show who just decided, you know what? Let's try and bump some ratings and leak this out on Reddit to get more people to watch. Just throwing that's it out there. Deal. Not a not a bad not a bad that's, thought. That's not a bad plug for the show. All right, I mean, so let's do this. About it. Let me ask you this. Yeah. What is more like, okay, let's just say he had left for personal issues for 11 days. I don't know about you, Myron, but that would be totally fine to me. Yes. Even if he wasn't Tom Brady, like people sometimes have things happen. I'd be okay with that. Yep, yep. That'd be right. fine. What if it turns out that it was to film The Mass Singer? Does that change your mind? Yeah, I mean, slightly. I mean, a couple of questions for that one. Is he still ready to go? Is he still Tom Brady? Because I think if he's winning and they're good, no one will care. I think the mass singer situation becomes a challenge if we get to week eight or week nine and he looks rusty or maybe isn't, you know, as sharp as you expected him to be. Then people might have something to say. But I think with Tom Brady, he could probably do anything. And the guys in that locker room would be like, okay, he's Tom Brady. But I just don't see a dude like that stepping aside to go do something like that for entertainment and leave his team in the middle of training camp. See, I do because you get you do what you can get away with, right? <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Like I mean he can he can do it, clearly. He can. It is an example though of let's say it ends up being the mass singer. I'm going to say at that point, Myron, I don't want to hear any football guy tell me like how tough you have to be to play football. Like, well, let me put it a different way. You do have to be tough to play football. But I don't want to hear a person tell me that, like, you can't miss a day. You got to be tough. Get on the field. If he went to the mass singer and he's still out there playing, like everybody needs to just take a step back and calm down. Yeah, everyone should calm down if that's the situation. Also, imagine if Aaron Rodgers had done this. I think we'd be having a different conversation. He might go to, like – a different kind of singer, though. Like, I feel like he would be going to, like, the hallucinogenic singer. Yeah, he'd be making an album or something. It'd be something yeah. else. So, well, nevertheless, glad to have him back. And if he's on The Masked Singer, I might actually watch that show, which I never once have in the history of its existence. Now, staying in the same division, we also found out today that Baker Mayfield is officially the Panthers' starting quarterback. We're going to go to the phone line to our guy. Nobody knows the Panthers more than David Newton. He's ESPN's NFL Nation Panthers reporter. And I'll just go straight to it, David. Why did they announce Baker (laughs) as the starter today? Well, it just sort of made sense. They wanted to give him a couple of weeks to really focus on the chemistry he has with his center, uh, with the wide receivers, and get all that down. And 
beforehand they were just getting basically go four snaps to Sam Darnold, four snaps to Baker Mayfield. So this way they can put all their emphasis on here. And it really was a foregone conclusion for weeks. I mean, the Panthers just needed to see that, that Baker could pick up the offense. And once he proved that he had kind of mastered the offense, then it was it was an easy decision for him. They, they know what Sam Darnold can do. They had him last year. He went four and seven. His numbers weren't great. So, again, this was this was Baker Mayfield's job to lose all along and he never really was in danger of losing. Where and how is Baker uh, an immediate upgrade from what we saw in Sam Donald last year? I think in terms of, of confidence and leadership, uh, I don't know if you saw the telecast the other night, but Steve Smith, the uh, former Panthers wide receiver who uh, is an analyst for the, the TV network for the Panthers, said that Sam Darnold basically could put you to sleep reading a book. Um, and, and I think that spoke volumes that, you know, that Sam's personality is not a rah-rah or fiery guy that, that gets a team ready, you know, down into two minutes, you know, got a game to win. Um, he's just not – he's not that kind of a guy. Baker Mayfield is. And plus, Baker Mayfield's done it before. I mean, he led a team to the playoffs. Sam Darnold hasn't. So, uh, I, I think from those standpoints, I mean, Sam Darnold's got a great arm. He's accurate when he's in practice, but when he gets in those game situations, when it's on the line, something happens inside that doesn't allow him to play to the level that everybody expected him to come out of Southern Cal. And Baker Mayfield, with that that personality he has, you know, he almost tries to defy logic by doing things out there at the end. So I, again, I just think a lot of it just comes down to that. It's just not one's got more talent than the other. I think one just has. You know more uh, in terms of, of leadership and, and ability to lead when the game's on the line. All right, I'm going to ask you two questions in before you get you out. Let, first of all, why, if he's the guy, why sit him against the Patriots? You would think he would need as much action as possible. And then second, I think the Baker Mayfield experience is also it can be wonderful, but it can be exhausting. Are we still on the wonderful side now? Well, first, the first part of that question is they'd gone through two days uh, of full practices against the, the Patriots, so they felt like that Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold got plenty of work in those because you, you're going to get more situational and more situations you want to put your quarterback through there than you are in a game, and plus they're protected there. They just don't want to risk him getting hurt. You saw what happened with Matt Corral, the rookie quarterback. He had his foot stepped on now. He's likely out for the season. As far as the the, the other, yeah, I mean, Baker even admitted today that he's held some of the back of what he wanted to, you know, his personality out on the field. And um, and, and he's going to face Cleveland in the opener. I, I asked him, I said, you really hadn't heard you, any fire out of you. What are we going to expect for that? And, and, and he again, he was kind of subdued. He said, I'm not going to tell you or sit here and say uh, I'm going to be a robot and say it doesn't matter because it will. And I keep going in other interviews I've done, I keep going back to Rashard Higgins, his wide receiver in Cleveland, who's now with the Panthers. He, he had even told me, he said, yeah, Baker's holding it back. And, and his words, he said, when it comes out, may God be with you. And, and I think wow. at some point, it may be in the Cleveland game, may God be with you, because I think we're going to see that. But he's had to focus so much on learning a new system. He's had to focus so much on getting to know his teammates and everything else. He really hasn't had time to, to come out there and be that personality that all the other the side shows that you get around him. David Newton, great stuff as always. ESPN's NFL Nation Panthers reporter at D Newton ESPN. We appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Appreciate it. You know what the thing I like, Myron, about the Panthers? Mm-hmm. It feels like to me, and this has been going on since they existed, to cover the Panthers – you got to sound like you're from Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Yep. Like they yep. don't just – they're like, well, you can't cover NASCAR or the Panthers unless you talk like that. Yeah. And that's why I like David Newton, and that's why I like Panthers reporters. Yeah, you got to be from a certain small town in North Carolina. <laughs> to and exactly. And it's got to be a North Carolina accent. Yeah. It can't even be country like me. It's got to yeah. be that North Carolina. Like, it's got to <laughs> yeah. be that. Yes, definitely. And that's what I like about David Newton. Spain and Fence, by the way, is presented by Progressive Insurance. You can get renter's insurance to protect the things that make your place a home, including coverage for theft or damage. Visit Progressive.com. Now, Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy, they got together, and they've come up with a new vision for the future of golf. I actually really like it. Will it be enough to knock off that crazy live tour once and for all? Myron and I will decide that. That's next here on Spain and Fence on ESPN Radio. 
I've got Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, the new owners of Wrexham AFC. FX presents Welcome to Wrexham, an original documentary series. You feel like you know what you're doing? Absolutely not. What happens when two Hollywood celebrities become owners of a Welsh football club? It's a community looking around going, what are these two guys doing here? If they're successful, it will be one of the biggest days in the history of the town. FX's Welcome to Wrexham, Wednesdays on FX, stream on Hulu. Yeah, right there on podcast, Ellie Wilson. And b and we're back, back. baby. <laughs> yeah, the laugh, you missed it, didn't you? August 18th. Constant elevation causes expansion. This guy goes by the name of Drake. Yes, man. sir. We got Cardi B, man, finally. <laughs> J. Cole. Light skin Jermaine. And we right in the, in the pit, man, with Nip Hustle. What's up, man? Man, you seem to be getting better. I'm like, that's what's supposed to happen. For our Off Podcast. Yeah, right yes, there. Lord. Yes. Listen and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to the Spain and Fitz podcast. It is Spain and Fitz here on ESPN Radio. Matt Jones, Myron Metcalf, presented by Progressive Insurance. I'm not sure there's any athlete in any sport in maybe since Jordan played basketball that has as much sway over the sport as Tiger Woods has over golf. Myron, if Tiger does something, it matters. And if he says something, it matters. That's why the Live Tour wanted to pay him $750 million to join the Live Tour. Because if he had, that wouldn't have been a death blow to the PGA Tour, but Myron, it would have been game on, right? If Tiger goes, a ton of those guys go just because of him, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when Tiger Woods decides, I'm staying on the PGA Tour and I'm going to try to make it better, it's a big deal. And he and Roy McIlroy – led a players-only meeting last week that basically brought the top 25 players in the world besides the couple that are in the Live Tour. And they said, what is the future of the PGA Tour going to look like? And they've come up with some proposals, the most important of which is, according to some reports, they are going to go to the PGA Tour and say, we think you should pick 15 events and make them the premier events. Limited fields, the top guys, and then the other 25 events, people play them and try to qualify for the 15. The top 25 players agreed that they'd play in three events that are outside of those 15. But those 15 become the 15 marquee events. The Live Tour, of course, is trying to do its own version of that by only having a few events and having the people play. Now the PGA Tour will decide whether or not to agree with the, uh, you know, proposed solution. What do you think of that, Myron? And do you think this is the kind of thing that could be what keeps the PGA Tour from really having to worry about the live? Yeah, I think it's a smart uh, idea. It's a smart concept. It does sound very live-like. I'm wondering why the PGA Tour, though, has been so slow to respond. I mean, what happened initially was the PGA Tour said – we're going to counter live tour by saying you don't want to take part in that dirty money, right? That didn't you don't work. want to be affiliate. Didn't work at all. And, and only within recent months did you hear Roy McIlroy and Tiger saying, wait a minute, this is a legitimate threat. And now it looks like you have some of the top golfers sitting down and saying, okay, we've got to be more fan friendly. We've got to do some of the things that the live tour is trying to do right now to preserve our tour because we can't match them financially. Like, you're not going to be able to give the guarantees they're giving to the golfers on that tour, but can you make the game more fun? It also sounds to me, Matt, that uh, golf's commissioner, PJ's Tour's commissioner is not Jay Moynihan, but it's actually Tiger Woods. It, it looks like be. Tiger Woods has become the lead guy and is saying, listen, everybody get behind me, follow me into this next era of the PGA Tour. I think it's brilliant because, look, the Live Tour has one, you, one thing going for it. What is that? Money. Money. That's it. Like, I mean, there's nothing else. Those tournaments are meaningless. I mean, if you turn them on, the guys playing in them don't care about them, right? Yeah. And, and, and the fact that the Bottle Rockets are playing against the Supersonics does not <laughs> matter to people because people don't even know what team they're on when they're watching the games. The tournaments don't matter. So it's clear that the competition is not working for people to watch as like a entertainment form. Yeah. Really, the only thing they have is they're making a lot of money. So what Tiger does is said, okay, here's the problem with the PGA Tour. They have too many events, right? The 2021-22 season ends this week at the PGA Tour Championship. Byron, then two weeks later, the new season starts. Yeah. 
And, like, that's crazy. Like, why is another season starting right now? Now, so what Tiger Woods basically says is let's pick a concrete amount of big-time events and let's make that what we know people got to watch. And then the rest of the tournaments are chances for people to get to those events. I love it. I think it's smart, and I think it it hits right at the Live Tour's weakness because, Myron, then those 15 tournaments become like where the greatest players play and where you got to show that you're the best in the world. Yeah. And it hits right at Liv's weaknesses, which is their tournaments don't matter. I think it's brilliant. It, it is. And Rory and Tiger this entire time, they've been selling the competitive value of the PGA Tour. Like if, if you want to prove that you're an elite golfer, this is how you do it. Uh, and I think to set these events aside makes a lot of sense. I think it's also a great opportunity for some of the up-and-coming golfers that people may not know aren't household names. I think it's an opportunity to market more of those players. And I think that will convince some of the young guys to stick around, right? They want to be more popular. They want to have what Tiger's gained over the course of his career. And maybe they'll go against this sort of guarantee that the Live Tour is offering. I do think, though, that the Live Tour has clearly proven to be a legitimate threat. See, I disagree with you. Well, here's here's my thought. Here's my thought, real or imagined, because clearly there's a threat for talent because they're taking some people that the PGA Tour would rather have. This does remind me a little bit, if you remember the XFL, the first XFL, right? And everyone said, oh, this is crazy. It'll never touch the NFL. And they were right. But the NFL did take note and say, you know what? Some of those camera angles are yeah, unique. That helps. Some of the flash yeah. is unique. And I feel like that's what the PGA Tour is doing with the Live Tour. They're saying, listen, they're not going to beat us, but let's take some of the things that maybe they're attempting to do and implement them into our game. I think actually the I, I like where you're going with the camera angles and stuff, but I think the better analogy is the first USFL, right? Yeah, because the first yeah, USFL, yeah. the problem was money. Now imagine if the USFL had all the money in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Because then they went and they got Herschel Walker and they got Doug Flutie and they got Steve Young, and all of a sudden, you know, they had a handful of guys. Now they didn't have the guys the NFL had. Yeah. And they didn't have the history, and they didn't have the relevance. Nobody cared when the New York Generals played the yeah. Birmingham whatevers. And that is something that they'll never be able to do. I think what was the key thing is they had to stop the bleeding. Because mm-hmm. most of the guys the Live Tour has, the PGA Tour does not care that they're gone. They care about Dustin Johnson. They care about Brooks Kepka. Bryson DeChambeau, and now if they lose Cam Smith, they care yeah. about him. That's it. They Still don't too. care about Patrick Reed. They don't care about all the 45-year-olds. They don't care about that. You lose four of them, Myron, it's kind of like Herschel Walker, Doug Flutie, Steve Young, right? Like yeah. you lose some guys, but everybody else is in the NFL. The key was stop the bleeding, and I think what Tiger Woods has done, maybe single-handedly along with Rory, is I think he stopped the bleeding with this meeting, and that will be ultimately what makes it very hard for Liv. Assuming Jay Monahan, Monahan says, yeah, these are things we Well, he'd be do. stupid if he does 100%. But I think what we're seeing is a shift in power. And I think you also see Rory and Tiger saying that the PGA Tour isn't moving fast enough. You're not doing enough to make these dramatic shifts that are going to make the game better. The other thing that the PGA Tour has over the Live Tour is you can't find a Live Tour. Like, how do you watch it? Everyone watches the PGA Tour every week. You can see it on all different channels. So they're still, for the average casual golf fan, they still have no idea what's going on with the Live Tour other than some of the headlines. Uh, but I think Tiger's in charge, and that's a good thing. The other thing is, and Tiger will never say this, the problem for them is right now the best players on the PGA Tour have no personalities. Yes. Like yeah. Scotty Scheffler. Scotty Scheffler could walk. He's maybe the best player in the world. He could walk down the street with a shirt that says, I'm Scotty Scheffler, and people be like, dude, get out of here. You're clogging the street. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I think that's the problem. Tiger, Rory, Phil, those guys had personalities. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if the if the tour is going to be personality deficient, then they got to do something else to make up for it. And having a more exciting format is maybe how you make that happen. I think the Live Tour maybe has made the PGA Tour more creative, and that could be a good thing long run. I agree with that. And they're also saying they're going to do like a top golf <laughs> like competition. I think that's probably pretty <laughs> stupid. But you know what? People love top golf, man. I don't know what it is, but people love their top golf. There you go. But Brady, Tom Brady is back. But are the Bucks ready to win another ring? We'll ask the expert next here on Spain and Fitz. Disney Plus Day is coming on September 8th. Yay! A day filled with specials, surprises, and exclusive premieres like Disney's Pinocchio, <laughs> Marvel Studios' Thor Love and Thunder, 
very, very impressive. Disney and Pixar's Cars on the Road. This is the beginning of something great. And National Geographic's Epic Adventures with Bertie Gregory. I have no idea what's in store for us. Because nothing beats Disney Plus Day. All of these and more streaming September 8th. Holy cow, what a ball game. We have here tonight in Pawtucket. There's no clock in baseball, but it was time that made an ordinary game legendary. It was just the battle. It was just the battle for the last run. And we got to 25 innings, 27 innings, 30 innings. I'm thinking, wow, we have a chance here tonight in little old Pawtucket, Rhode Island, to get in the history books. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to the Spain and Fitz Podcast. You know, Myron, I Mm -hmm. used to think I was like a young man kind of understood the scene you know what yeah. i mean like just i was i was with pop culture yeah and then i got on espn radio i've gotten a little older in my early 40s and we work with all these young kids and so yeah. greg allman has joined us he's the buccaneers reporter for the athletic and i thought he said greg allman yeah and i was like of the allman brothers and the in the and ben in the studio goes who are the allman brothers <laughs> and i was like rambling man and he goes never heard of it and i said that's impossible there's no way you don't know rambling man we play it and he has never heard this song now myron you and i are not ancient like we know little dirk we know what the kids are listening to how Mm -hmm. can he not know rambling man they didn't have those 2 a.m infomercials man with the eight cds 7.99 Eight easy payments. What a deal that song. was! How did was how did they pull that off? I could get I eight know. CDs for a dollar for for a dollar. Somebody was losing money. I know. I understand Greg's there, but I wanted to finish this conversation, which was I cannot believe that Ben did not know it. But Greg Allman is here. He is the Buccaneers reporter for the Athletic. I'm sure you are familiar with the Allman Brothers classic hit, right? <laughs> I am, and I thought when he passed away I would uh, get less of this, but it's still like the easiest, best bumper music you can get to intro an interview with me, so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have got it, gotten it if I hadn't brought it up because they didn't know who he was, but nevertheless. That's, Hang on it, now. I know who old. he was. Ben didn't know who he was. Yes. All right. Well, Ben needs to work on his musical knowledge. Now, what we may all need to work on our musical knowledge in case Tom Brady is on The mass Singer, which is, of course, the rumor online. Brady returns to camp. First of all, I'm sure it was good to have him back. But for those of us that haven't been following the day-to-day, is there any chance he took 11 days off to do the Mass Singer? There, there is not. And he actually just took to social media and, and actually tweeted that he wasn't on the, the Mass Singer, okay, which, of course, good. is exactly what the Mass Singer would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think he skipped out on the team that he came out of retirement for to do a, a singing reality TV gig. Thank you. So I'm listening to Todd Bowles. Uh, the first press conference, we sort of said, hey, you know what, this is all planned in advance. I listened to him a couple of days ago. He said, you know what, I'll be concerned if it lasts longer than maybe next week. Do, do you get the sense that this is a guy who was fully prepared for this, or is there maybe a, some frustration that your starting quarterback hasn't been available for a week and a half? No, I, I think Todd I think Todd was kind of vague and perhaps at the detriment of, of – kind of adding to the confusion of what was going on. But I think I think it was more intended to be kind of protecting Tom and not putting like a specific public deadline out there where it might seem like some kind of ultimatum where if he had said he'll be back on Monday and, and he isn't, we're all writing about how he isn't back on Monday. So I, I think the message kind of got a little lost. But I think what they tried to convey was that there was an arrangement and they were confident he'd be back. You know, there's that natural paranoia since the guy's already retired once this year. Uh, then he might be having second thoughts or second thoughts about his second thoughts coming back. Uh, and it looks like that wasn't the case. He's back. If he's there tomorrow, you kind of take it one day at a time right now. It's obviously the case that if you're Tom Brady, you get more leeway on these kind of things than you would if you're somebody else. And I am a big believer that, assuming he wasn't on The mass Singer, that's really nobody's business what he was doing. W- with that said, I yeah. mean, do you think – not with his – I mean, do you think that other players would have been able to do this? Or is this really a Brady thing that, like, he's earned the ability to do something like this and that's why everybody's okay with it? Yeah, I mean, definitely. There's nobody – I always say that Tom Brady is exceptional in every way. That There's nobody that has the clout he has to talk when he wants, to clearly practice when he wants. 
Um, and I think especially if it's something as, as personal as, you know, whatever he's dealing with. Like I said, this isn't a reality show. This isn't him uh, going off to reshoot a movie. I, I think this is, this is time that was personal for him. So um, what Cam Brate said today is that if anybody has earned the right to pull off an 11 day break in the middle of training camp, it, it's Brady. And you just have to trust that he wouldn't do that unless he thought it was really necessary. This is a guy that, that doesn't take days off. that doesn't take snaps off. And he took 11 days off. So w- whatever his reasons, I think, you know, he's back and you have to hope that he's certainly focused now and with the team, for the next three weeks, getting ready for the opener. We know mid forties Tom Brady can throw for five thousand plus yards in seventeen games, lead this team to another Super Bowl. Uh, but we also don't know about the state of that offensive line with some significant injuries it has suffered in the last couple of weeks. What's the latest there, and and how vulnerable do some of those injuries make Tom Brady going forward? Yeah, I mean, losing Ryan Jensen, losing your Pro Bowl center on the second day of camp is not how you want to come back. Uh, out of retirement, uh, and that's a significant loss. They, they have a guy named Robert Hainsey, who's a second-year guy, a third-year pick last year out of Notre Dame, that they like, um, that they drafted to be the successor to Ryan Benson. I don't think uh, this was the circumstances they had in mind. Um, and then Saturday, in, in the game in Nashville, they lost uh, a guy who was competing for the left guard spot named Aaron Stinney, who started for him in the Super Bowl. Uh, but they drafted, they, they have a rookie named Luke Gedeke they like a lot, that, that has been the intended starter at left guard. Uh, Gedeke had two holding penalties Saturday night. So the, the juxtaposition of him struggling and a veteran who was their probably their most experienced option, uh, tearing his ACL and his MCL, that's not good. But I, I don't think it's any reason to panic. I don't think they have to go out and make a big move. Uh, they're going to have a left guard in the center who are very young by NFL standards. Um, you know, They have to hope that what they have in two good tackles in an experienced guard in Shaq Mason is enough to kind of help them ease into that. They, they probably won't be the best offensive line in football last year, nobody gave up less sacks than the Bucks did. And in honestly, in Brady's career, he had the lowest sack percentage of his career, which is what you want if you have a 44 year old quarterback. So I don't think they will be as steady as they were last year, but I don't think it'll be uh, a liability, uh, an impediment to them trying to win another division title and, and make a splash in the playoffs. Talking to Greg Allman, Buccaneers reporter for The Athletic. I know you're a reporter and not an analyst, but nobody knows the team better than you do. So let me let me ask you this. Two years ago, this is a team that wins the Super Bowl. Now, two years later, it feels like to me that people just sort of skip over them, and I don't really know why. So I would ask you, compare this team to the one that won it all. Is it equal, worse? Like, how how if I'm just looking at a big picture, what am I seeing? Um, there's no Gronk, so it starts there. There's They definitely took some leadership losses on the defensive side. And Dominican Sue's not back. Jason Pierre-Paul's not back. Um, I think Akeem Hicks can can kind of step in very well for what Dominican Sue was on this team. Um, they're probably more talented at receiver. I mean, to have Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, Julio Jones and Russell Gage as your top four, um, even good. if you had a drop-off at tight end, that's a pretty good top four. So I think they'll score a lot of points. I think their defense will be a lot healthier than it was last year. I mean, the single biggest thing working against them last year was just a ridiculous amount of injuries uh, in the secondary. They lost a, a key tackle in the playoffs. So if they're healthier, I, I think this will be closer to 2020 than it was 2021 for sure. Bruce Aarons is sort of the cool uncle, you know, had that personality. And it seems like Todd Bowles has the personality of like every intro to econ professor in America. <laughs> There's a huge difference. <laughs> How do you think that affects the team, and what's the difference between the two guys? That's not nice. Um, Todd, Todd Bowles has a really understated sense of humor. Uh, he doesn't break it out often enough, but it's definitely a different personality to this team. Um, you know, Bruce was so kind of blunt and eminently quotable uh, that, yeah, by comparison, Todd Bowles does seem dry. Um, but, no, I think this is, Todd Bowles is very much an extension of – the principles and the tone and demeanor of a Bruce Arians team. Just because, I mean, Todd played for Bruce at Temple, whatever, 39 years ago. Um, you know, the the feel of this team should really be about the same. You have a different head coach, you have a different personality there, but I don't think there's a much uh, a dramatic difference. I think it's probably as easy a transition from one head coach to another as you can have, just because Bowles ran the defense last year, he's running the defense this year. Uh, Byron Leftwich called the offense last year, he'll do the same this year. And Bruce Arians is still around. Bruce Arians is at practice every day in a golf cart, going around, talking to players and coaches like he did last year. So uh, there's a fairly close resemblance between the two, at least in terms of leadership and message. 
Greg Allman, Buccaneers reporter for The Athletic, crushes it. Hopefully we'll not have to enter to the Allman brothers again <laughs> on this show because I'm not going to embarrass Ben, the producer, anymore. But thank you very much for your time. No problem, guys. Take care. Have a good night. That was really mean of you, by the way, to say that he's like an econ no, I just, professor. I, just, I mean, there are no more boring people on the planet than econ professors. Well, it's just, it's just a whole – it's a it's a shift from Bruce Arians to Ty Bowles. No, but, like, like you have to call him an econ professor. I mean, I, I literally, mean, if I were ranking the people I'd want to hang out with, econ professors would be almost at the bottom. Have you heard of Ty Bowles' press conference? I mean, it does I know, but I feel like Todd vibe. Bowles and I could at least, you know – we can hang. I just, I, I, I just think that was one of that's one of the rudest things I've ever heard you say about a person. You, you would do all the talking at that lunch. Is all I'm saying. It just doesn't I do seem all like the there's talking. A lot there. That's all. I do that's all, all the all. talking at most lunches. I like him. Just not a lot of you know. You just pizzazz. don't want to spend any time with him. Spain and Fitz is brought to you by Boost Mobile, a proud sponsor of the 2022 Department of Defense Warrior Games. With Boost Mobile, feel the power of more money in your pocket on one of America's largest 5G networks. All of a sudden, people started calling college football week zero. I don't know how that happened, but that's happening, and it's this week. College football is this weekend. Is this the year Texas A&M breaks through? What about Clemson? We're going to do some over-unders for college football. That's next here on Spain and Fitz. You're listening to the Spain and Fitz podcast. That's right. You all going to make us lose our mind here on Spain and Fitz. Presented by Progressive Insurance. He is Meyer Metcalf. I'm Matt Jones. Were you a DMX fan? Oh, yeah, man. Every album. That's yeah, right. I love DMX. Yeah, I was a rough rider. Still am. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's time to do a little college football. It's week zero. Not a lot of great games this week. I think uh, you got Vandy and Hawaii playing each other for reasons I'm not certain. But there is football, and that's exciting. And so what I wanted to do was we picked out eight teams that, for whatever reason, are particularly interesting this year. And we're going to do the over-unders. I'm going to give Myron the the team and the number, and you can't say push. You got to go over or under, because if you don't have one, then like you're not spending any money. And we're we're going to pour place in bets. So let's get started. Texas A&M eight and a half. Man, I think uh, they have the weapons uh, offensively. Uh, I think they'll be solid defensively. Eight and a half is a big, big number. Uh, as a Betty man, I'm going to say under on Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M. I just think that that league, as you know, is just so unpredictable. Uh, there just aren't any easy games. And I think, you know, it's easy for you to get into a, a couple of three-point matchups and they don't go your way. So that number's a little high for me. I'm going the under. I love the over. Love it. Love it. Because love they're it. Ro- it's all about road games, right? Okay, so they're going to lose at Alabama. So what? But then they play at South Carolina. They're winning that one. At Auburn, Auburn, besides Vandy, might be the worst team in the SEC this year. And so I, I like it. I think they're, they're, they're tough games. They play uh, Arkansas at home, Miami at home. I'm, a, I'm, I'm big on the over here. This is one of the ones I like uh, absolutely the most. And you don't even have a comment with how much I like it. Nevertheless, I, I thought we were going to the next team. I, I know, know, but I just wanted you to appreciate what I said. But nevertheless, I Michigan good. State, seven and a half. I think Michigan State is a, a team that – I don't want to say the, the, the word overachieved. I think that's unfair when we say that to teams. But I think 11 wins ain't, ain't happening. Um, I think Mel Tucker did an incredible job. I think he deserved every cent he got uh, for, from that university – they're going to be good defensively and offensively. Again, I don't think they'll be as good as last year's team. Uh, but I think seven and a half, half is a good number. I'm going to pick the over there for a team that's hosting Ohio State and Wisconsin. They do have to go to Michigan and Penn State. The, the thing is, it's hard for me to find the fifth loss because they have Ohio State, yeah. Wisconsin, Mi- uh, Michigan, and Penn State. All right, let's just assume they lose all those. But to go under, they got to lose to either Rutgers, Illinois, Maryland, or Minnesota. I think they win all those. So I'm with you. I feel like they've overachieved, but just because of schedule, I feel like I got to go over. What about Oklahoma? Nine and a half. I mean, you you know, you're bringing in a new coaching staff, uh, Brent Venables. We know what he's capable of doing. Uh, So I don't think there's a drop off there really from, from Lincoln Riley. Uh, I think this is going to be another quality Oklahoma team. And I think the, the, the schedule is favorable to go to TCU, they host Texas while well in Dallas. They go to Iowa State. 
at Virginia, at Texas Tech. I think those are all winnable games at an Oklahoma team. So give me the overall day on that. I, I would bet that if for anybody. I do too. I like the over. Again, you got to find me the games they're going to lose. They host Baylor. They host Oklahoma State. They do go to Texas Tech. They go to West Virginia. They're not going to lose all those games. Go to TCU. Their non-conference game is Nebraska. They're going to win that one too. So I got the over. I don't love that one, but I'm certainly, if I have to bet it, I'm going to go with the over. Texas. What about the Texas Longhorns perpetually and under? Uh, just named Quinn Ewers, uh, starting quarterback. He won that quarterback battle uh, after transferring back to, from Ohio State. I mean, he's a Texas guy. Uh, I think still to have questions, though, you know, at that position. No guarantees there. B. John Robinson, we know what he is. He's going to be a Heisman Trophy candidate. Again, it's going to come down to, to scheduling. Is this a team that you think can really get to nine wins? I, I'm not convinced. Oklahoma's a loss. I think even hosting Iowa State's a loss. I think you lose at Oklahoma State. TCU, Baylor, one of those games you lose. I would bet you the didn't under. Even, you didn't even mention Alabama. <laughs> didn't even mention that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, that's an under for me. Me too. I think that's definitely an under. I think that actually is I, – I don't know where they get the, the ninth win. I mean, even if they just lose to the teams they're supposed to, they're not getting a ninth win. So, I'm, I, I'm out. Kentucky is eight. Go Cates. You like eight. I would bet the over there, but I'm hesitant. I don't know what's going on with Chris Rodriguez – and that potential uh, disciplinary action there. Wondell Robinson, you lose a guy like that. I mean, that's a major blow. Will Levis is going to be a top 10 pick, I think, in the NFL draft. But I think guys like that are much better before you put that top 10 pick spotlight on them sometimes. So how does he handle that pressure? The defense under Mark Stoops is always going to be good, always going to be dependable. I'll pick the over on that, but I'm not 100% committed to that. That's kind of how I am. I'm, I'm over. I actually think if for a long time it was seven and a half, and I thought it was a lock at seven and a half. Because I think if you look at their schedule, it's hard to find five games they lose, but they play Georgia and then they go to Tennessee, Old Miss, and Florida. They got to win one of those games to hit the over. But even if they lose them all, you're pushing Myron, so I would take the over. I think they're either going to win eight or nine, and if I get eight, then I know I'm at least pushing, so I'm taking the over. Clemson's ten and a half. What do you got? It's just a big number, man. That's just a big number for a team that doesn't have a guy like Trevor Lawrence anymore. Um, at the same time, you're, you're in the ACC where it feels like you know, who, who are you going to run into yeah. uh, other than maybe going to Notre Dame. Uh, Miles Murphy's a name that everyone should know. Obviously, that defensive lineman, that defensive line will be really, really tough. But I just can't go that high of a number. Uh, so give me the under there. Ten and a half's tough. I mean, they, they go to Notre – they host Notre Dame. And then – or no, they go to Notre yeah, Dame. Go to Notre Dame. Me. Yeah, yeah. Go to Notre Dame. They go to Wake Forest and they host NC State. So, to, to, to get to the at 11, you got to assume that they win two of those three. If I, I think they can, but if I'm going to have to pick one, I'm going to pick the under. This would be one I would stay away from, though, in actually betting it. Uh, in the end, I probably wouldn't. Utah, some people have a pick to go to the title game, or at least to the playoff, nine. If you want to win some money this year, if you want to look like the smartest person in the room, bet the over here on Utah. I mean, a lot of really smart college football minds are all in on Kyle Winningham's team. And if you look at the schedule, you get it. They come out of the gate, they go to Florida, they win that game. It's Southern Utah, San Diego State, Arizona State, Oregon State, all winnable games. They go to UCLA, host USC. And then from there, I mean, who's their toughest test? They got to go Oregon. to Oregon. So I, I think I would bet the over all day on Utah, which has the schedule to sneak their way into the college football playoff conversation this year for sure. Yeah, my exam, the, I'm back here with the same thing of find me their fourth loss. I'm going to yeah. take the over. I'm not certain they win 10, but I look at I okay, the, okay, let's assume they lose to Oregon. Maybe they lose to USC. Maybe they lose at Florida, although I think they win that game. That's yeah. three losses. Now find me a fourth one. I just don't think there's a fourth one on the schedule. And because there's not a fourth one, I don't have to worry about losing. I can push. I'm taking the over with Utah. Michigan, nine and a half. Still a big number in the Big Ten, but I think the schedule favors Michigan to hit the over there. I mean, once you get into the Big Ten, they have to go to Iowa. Always going to be a tough game at Indiana, but then they host Penn State, Michigan State, Nebraska, Illinois. They go to Rutgers. I mean, it could come down in terms of them hitting the over to that November 26 matchup at Ohio State, which could have college football playoff implications there. But I would bet the over on this Michigan team uh, that I think obviously gained a lot of momentum last year. I'm going under just because to get to 10, they're going to have to win 
uh, three of these games at Iowa, Penn State, Michigan State, at Ohio State. They're just not winning three of those. They might win. Uh, they might win two, but they're not winning three. I'm going to take the under on Michigan. That was fun, Meyer. That you was, didn't man. make any egregious decisions, which I no. like. Now Lamar <laughs> Jackson has taken okay. an insane amount of hits, too many hits. So how does that affect his contract situation? That's next here on Spain Fitz. You're listening to the Spain and Fitz podcast. It is Spain and Fitz here on ESPN Radio. Presented by Progressive Insurance. He's Meyer Metcalf. I'm Matt Jones. We're filling in. Spain and Fitz, they got other things to do. And I understand. But we are here to let you be ready for a big night in sports. Right now, the Yankees lead the Mets in the middle of the fourth, two to nothing. The Yankees, by rule, Myron, are only allowed to play three teams the Mets, the Red Sox, <laughs> and the Blue Jays. They are not, no other games are scheduled in the Yankee season. Um, but this is game 37 of the Yankees Mets series. And uh, you, you, we, the Yankees have a lot. I mean, you got managers getting upset. Are they going to turn it around, Myron? It, it does not feel that way. I mean, what are they, 10 and 20, I think, since the All Star break? I mean, you shouldn't have that kind of roster and be 10 and 20 over your last 30 games. It's not a good look right now. It isn't. But if you beat the Mets two in a row, yeah. that's the kind of thing that can turn the fans back around it. There was a great piece today on ESPN.com by Jamison Hensley. And he was detailing the amount of contact quarterbacks get since entering the league. And I didn't realize this. So he went back since 2018, which is of course uh, four seasons. And he sort of registered how many times a quarterback has been hit. So how many times a quarterback taken a hit and here are the numbers in fifth place. Myron's favorite quarterback, Carson Wentz, 496 hits. Fourth place, Matt Ryan, 502 hits. Third, Russell Wilson, 529. Second, big jump to Josh Allen at 610. But first place by 100 with 710 times he's been hit, Lamar Jackson. And what's interesting about that is a couple of those guys, Matt Ryan and Carson Wentz, are not considered the most mobile guys. But the top three are mobile quarterbacks. But even amongst mobile quarterbacks, Lamar Jackson's been hit 100 times more than anybody else. Now, he has bulked up this year for training camp. He's 230 pounds, which is 18 pounds more than what he weighed last season. But he did miss four games in 2021 with a bone bruise. But when you see that number, Myron, and you hear that he's taken 100 more hits than any other quarterback. What are your thoughts? I think it's concerning. I mean, to your point, he missed four games last year, uh, I believe five games, and then he missed a game in the previous two seasons. So uh, he's being compared to guys who haven't missed many games. And I think you have to think that that's maybe the delay in sort of this contractual obligation. Now, I think it's arrogant of the Baltimore Ravens to not give Lamar Jackson a huge guarantee when it's like, how are you all going to do better uh, than what you've seen. You've had Joe Flacco. You've had Trent Dilfer. Yes, you've won Super Bowls with those guys. But this is a player that you've never had before who can lead you into this next generation. Former MVP, better numbers than Deshaun Watson. So I, I think it's silly to not pay him. At the same time, if there is a hesitation, this is what it's all about. Can Lamar Jackson remain as elusive in the years ahead if he's already taken this number of hits? I think you have to be worried about that if you're a Ravens fan and maybe if you're that organization. The talent is unlike anything we've seen. At the same time, that style in a league full of fast safeties, linebackers, defensive ends, dangerous to play football that way. But isn't what you just said the reason why they're hesitant, which is they won a Super Bowl with Joe Flacco and Trent Dilfer? I mean, like if you were to sit there over the last 30 years and say, okay, give me an example – of how you can win a Super Bowl without an elite quarterback, they have the two examples. I mean, the two most yeah. prominent examples are them. Now, of course, there were special circumstances. You had an a, extraordinary defense, right? You had ha- multiple Hall of Famers, and that clearly is a big reason why. But I do think there's got to be a part of sort of organizational history where you say, look, we had these two dudes. We know Lamar's better than those two dudes. But we had these two dudes and got it done, and Lamar hasn't won a playoff game yet. I mean, on yeah. some level, I think ultimately not paying them will hurt them because they're going to end up paying him more. That's my guess. Yeah. But at the same time, if it were me, 
and I'm sitting there looking at a guy that's gotten 710 hits, and I'm asking myself, realistically, how long can this guy play like this? Realistically. I mean, 10 years, five years, yeah. I don't know. I don't think waiting is absurd, Mike. It's not absurd. You want to pay him more. To, to your point, I mean, but what if you don't? What if he ends up getting hurt and then you have to pay him less? That, that's that's obviously a possibility. But if you've watched the Dak Prescott situation, if you watch some of these other situations develop, like you you want to pay him now because it's only going to get more and more expensive to afford a guy Lamar Jackson. I also think that you're right. They have won Super Bowls. Uh, without a guy of this caliber. But they also had guys like Ray Lewis and Ed Reed, and this wasn't even a top-10 defensive unit. I think this is an NFL where you have to have a dynamic quarterback to have a chance to win a Super Bowl. I mean, you got to beat Mahomes, and you got to beat you know Justin Herbert and these young guys coming up. Uh, and if you can't match that firepower, I don't think you have a chance. I mean, this isn't 2010, or this isn't the year 2000. So, I think you have to pay Lamar Jackson because there's no better option. He's been an MVP in that system. You have to take the chance. When you're investing in a dude like that, you're paying for the possibility. And the possibilities around Lamar Jackson are incredible. Give him his money despite the concerns about his bonus. Would you make him the highest paid player in the league? Because that's probably what it would take. Yes, he, he deserves more a bigger guarantee than Deshaun Watson. His numbers are better. He's better than Deshaun Does Watson. Does he deserve more money than Patrick Mahomes? Because that's what you're doing. Everybody brings up Deshaun Watson, but maybe Cleveland just overpaid. Does he deserve more money than Patrick Mahomes? I mean, it's kind of unfair to talk about Mahomes because of when Mahomes got his deal and the guaranteed money he got at the time. But I think he deserves the most money in terms of a guarantee we've ever seen with a quarterback based on the market. Well, just based on what we do with quarterbacks. Like Joe Burrow's going to get it next year. Justin Herbert's going to get it. You know, so with the quarterback who is the top guy at the time, you're going to pay him the most money. And my guess is Lamar Jackson is saying, listen, that dude with everything he has going on off the field in Cleveland got $230 million. I'm not taking a dime less. And you know what? I'm all in favor of that attitude because his numbers are better than Deshaun Watson's and he has an MVP. Well, okay. I mean, (laughs) if you set the standard of I need to be making more money than everyone that's ever been overpaid, (laughs) <laughs> then that's going to be tough. Let, let me ask you this. Let's say you got, let's say that for whatever reason, they don't get it worked out. Yeah. At the end of the year, let's say he has a good year, but he missed, let's just say he has the year he had last year. He misses four or five games. They Let's even say they go to the playoffs losing the first round. You still investing in him? Yeah, because I just don't know what, what your better option is. Like what, what, if you're Baltimore and you're looking out in the next five years, what are the chances you find someone who's going to play MVP level football, who's going to be that kind of a playmaker who can take you to the next level? Like what what are the chances there? See, my thing is, okay, so if let's say that Myron what your position just was. Let's say he had the same year he had last year, missed five games with injury, don't win a playoff game. If the Ravens position is, yes, we would still pay him, then I'm with you, they should pay him now. Because yeah. Like, all that is, is he's one year further down the road towards potential career-ending injury, and you're still paying him. So why aren't you doing it now? But I would say to you, for me, if that happened, and he takes 175 more hits, then I might not pay. Because the thing is, what you don't want to have is a situation where, Myron, if what you're saying is right, the Ravens, the only way they're not going to pay him is if he has a career-ending injury. And you don't want that, right? So I I just – I hate this because you know I've been as big a fan of Lamar as existed. I was a fan when it wasn't cool, yeah. right? But I don't know, man. I don't know if I would put that kind of money into it because quarterback's the one position you can't get wrong. Yeah. And I just wonder if there's going to be a year. It won't be this year. It won't be next year. But three years from now, when he takes a steep drop off and you just have him. But when is that drop off coming? I mean, we've been talking about that drop off since I he haven't came into been the talking league. About it, but yeah, he, people but, have been. People have been, and so fine, you get to the end of this season, you're not certain on a long-term deal, so you franchise tag them. And the franchise tag is the average of the top five salaries at that position in the NFL. Guys are making forty. But it's not that dollars. year. It's not that year they're worried about. It's year f- – I don't think any of them are worried about the next year. They'd pay him for the next year. It's four or five years from now. That's what I'd be worried about. You don't want to franchise tag him a couple times, have to give him almost $100 million, and then have to give him another deal. Like, that's the scenario that could play out if everything works out in Lamar's favor. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I think it's a tough – I think Lamar's one of the toughest choices for a team 
especially because he's his own agent and he ain't going to take less. That's true. And that makes it even harder. Spain and Fitz is presented by Progressive Insurance. Progressive Commercial Insurance can protect your small business with over 30 coverage options. They have an easy-to-use mobile app, personalized discounts, and more. You can get a quote in as little as six minutes. That's crazy. It's progressivecommercial.com. Discounts and coverage selections are not available in all states or situations. Don't forget that. What I'm excited about is having this next conversation with Myron. It's hard to talk about guys who aren't adults, but Bronny James is going to be picking a college this year. And I'm not sure there's ever been a college decision from a non-top player in the country that's more fascinating. We'll get into it next here on Spain and Fitz. You're listening to the Spain and Fitz podcast. It is Spain and Fitz on ESPN Radio. We're presented by Progressive Insurance. I'm Matt Jones. He's Myron Metcalf. Now, it's hard when you talk about high school kids because you got you can't do like some people on other networks and be, you know, rude. Or terrible, yeah. So, <laughs> so we want to have a conversation in the most upbeat, positive way possible. But we are talking about LeBron James kid. Bronny James. And he is going to be the most fascinating high school basketball recruit in years because people care who don't even care about college basketball. Yeah. So I want to take Myron – who is a college basketball reporter here for ESPN, through a number of steps, and you answer these questions for me, okay? okay? Number one, if you were Bronny James, would you definitely go to college instead of, say, the G League or Overtime Elite? Yes. There, there uh, is nothing but positives for Bronny going to college. Development, brand, an opportunity to sort of establish himself as Bronny James and not just LeBron's kid. All positives for Bronny to go to college. Um, and I think if he decides not to, I don't think that'll be a good move for him. Yeah, he, unlike a lot of kids, he doesn't need the money, right? So no. a lot of kids go to G League or overtime because they just, their families need money. Mm-hmm. Well, he doesn't. And from a brand standpoint, if nothing else, I mean, Bronny's got the Arch Manning situation, right? Like you'll be the biggest star in the sport. Yep. So I'm with you. Got it. You need to go to college basketball. All right. He is ranked by ESPN the 39th ranked prospect in the country. Now, Myron and I don't do recruiting on no. the on that level, but you and I have seen recruiting rankings and players for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Do you believe, having seen Bronny play and having seen what the 39th ranked player in America usually looks like, that he is as good as his rankings suggest? I'm not convinced of that, you know, and that's stuff, nothing against the rankings, but I think when you're Bronny James, there's obviously an element of that helps you being LeBron's son. I mean, seeing him play, he's a six, two, he's a really strong young man. Like he, you know, he's got that LeBron gene. You can see that physically. Um, but, but beyond that, you know, I don't know that even to this point, he's shown sort of the skill that's going to say, okay, this is how he becomes an all Pac-12 or all Big Ten, all SEC kind of player. Like, you don't see those elements yet. Now, again, he's a senior in high school. All of that could change. But there's nothing obvious about his game that makes you say, okay, he's definitely going to go to the next level and have an incredible career. Yeah, I would say, to me, I tier college basketball recruits in four tiers. Tier one is, this dude's a star. Mm -hmm. He's going to be drafted in the top ten. He's definitely not that. No. Tier two is, this dude's really, really good. If he goes to the right place and things go well, he can be a first-round pick. He's not that. No. Tier three is, this guy's got the potential to have a lot of talent. If things go great for him, maybe he can play in the league, and he can be a really good college player. I would put Bronny in that group. Yes. Right, And then tier four is needs to go to the right program and be a good fit. He's better than that. But I do think he is not a guy that on any level he certainly not can't miss. And I don't even think he certainly project first round guy. Do you agree with that? Yes. I don't think there's anything to suggest he's definitely a first round pick. The difference with Bronny is that if his dad is saying, I want to play with Bronny. That's a different situation. He's a one and done no matter what because and that may be true. a chance. Yeah. And, they, and that may be true, but I'm just saying if we're just trying to essentially evaluate as a prospect. Yes. Okay. Here are his offers. Kentucky, Michigan, 
Ohio State, and USC. That's what ESPN is reporting his offers are. Oregon, UCLA, Kansas, Duke, and North Carolina are included in his school list. It isn't clear which of those besides Oregon is has offered them. So UCLA, Kansas, Duke, and North Carolina, not sure if they've offered or not. Oregon, USC, Ohio State, Michigan, and Kentucky reportedly have. Now, when I see that, Myron, with the exception of Kentucky, where his dad has a relationship with Cal Perry, yeah. that's sort of second tier of recruiting. Right? Yeah. First tier is Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, North Carolina, UCLA. Second tier is Michigan, Ohio State, USC, Oregon. Do you think if his name was Bronny Smith, Oregon, USC, Ohio State, Michigan are recruiting him? Uh, probably not, you know. It's certainly not as hard. Um, but I think that's what makes this so complicated. If you get Bronny James, you get obviously the, the most popular player in that class – you get a, a, a certain audience that's going to come just to see him play, whether he's good or not. You get dad showing up to games. So there are elements that coaches have to consider that you're just not considering with any other prospect. So the name carries a lot of weight there. The one name on that list that looks like the best program and the one that produces NBA players is Kentucky. If you were Bronny James' friend and LeBron's buddy and you were giving him advice – would you tell him to go to a Kentucky-type school? No. I would say stay away from those schools because those schools aren't going to give you the opportunity to develop because there's just too much talent. Like I don't think Le- I don't think Bronny can come in and play at Kentucky, play at Duke, play at a So you don't like believe that? that. You, you, if it's no. Kentucky or Duke, you don't think Bronny plays for him? Not right away. And, and maybe he's a guy who – if he decides to stick around a couple of years and develops, but not he's not coming in right away. And at those schools, the expectation is you want to play right away. I mean, you don't want to be Bronny James at a school with a giant spotlight and, not and you're playing. not playing. That's true. You don't That's want the worst case scenario. Worst me. case scenario. All right. So do you think LeBron says to one of these schools like an Oregon, USC, Ohio State, he'll come, but he better play? I think that's understood. I mean, I think that's got to be understood on some level. And I think every coach who's recruiting him – at that level will feel that pressure. Now, Ohio State, I think, has developed guys like that in the past, those kind of blue-collar 6'2", 6'3", guys. Like Chris Holtman kind of masters that. At the same time, if it's brand, if it's Nike and all the things attached to it, of course it's Oregon. But I think any coach who adds Bronny James to the roster, and it's not just going to be LeBron. Like, I don't know that LeBron is going to demand a guarantee. It's going to be the fans. It's going to be everybody who wants to see him play. And that's the thing. That demand might not exist at Kentucky and Duke where the fans want to win, but it will exist at some of these other schools where they want to have fun. All right, let me ask you this. How big an NIL deal does Bronny get no matter where he goes? Oh, man, he's going to get probably the biggest. I mean, him and Arch Manning are going to be in college at the same time, and and they'll definitely have the biggest NIL deals of anybody, I think, in in college sports. But that's a factor. I've been to games. I went to Virginia when LeBron showed up with his whole crew. And that's an event in and of itself. Yeah, it is. You're going to get that at Bronny's games in college, and you're going to get all the celebrities. You know Drake's coming to a game, Matt. You know like all these guys are going to come because of Bronny, uh, and that's going to be what everybody has to assess. So my view for. has always been, if you're Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, it's really not worth it. No. But if you're Michigan, Ohio State, USC, Oregon, you do it for all the secondary benefits. Yes. If do you he's agree with play. that? If he's going to play. Like that, well, that but that's a big a if. Is he going to play? I, I think you sign him. You're, assu- you're assuming you just you're gonna assume give him a you're playing him. You're going to give him a chance. Yeah, he is going to be fascinating to watch. He will because he's going to get offers he wouldn't otherwise get. And then what happens? Yeah. I think it'll be fascinating. Did the Giants' top draft pick get taken out by a dirty hit? A lot of people have strong opinions. We'll tell you ours next on Spain and Fitz. You're listening to the Spain and Fitz podcast. That's right. You won't break our song here on Spain and Fitz on ESPN Radio. Presented by Progressive Insurance. Who is this? Who is this fine singer? It's Beyonce, and it's You Won't Break My Soul. That's the song. Yeah, I I messed that up bad, didn't I? That's right. I mean, I didn't know it was Beyonce. I probably should have known that. I do like to the left, to the left. (laughs) (laughs) What are you laughing at? I don't think you're not. Listen, let me tell you something. I like working with you, but you're not irreplaceable, Myron Metcalf. (laughs) 
But I know what you just said to the left, to the left, as if that were the song. Well, I mean, that's in the song, isn't it? Doesn't she it say is, to is. the left, to the it left, is. everything's in the box to the left? A, she does say that. She, she called a cab on him. That was her car he was driving. That's true. That's true. All right, that's now, true. We digress. Uh, right now, the Jets and the Falcons are playing on ESPN. Falcons lead 10 to nothing over the Jets. Uh, no Zach Wilson. And uh, do you expect anything from the Falcons this year at all? Me? No. Well, no, the other people I'm doing the show with. Yeah, of course you. <laughs> well, I don't know if we were going to our guest or not. Uh, no, Marcus Mariota's there. I think they're there to tank and to go after a top five quarterback. Well, he'll be on with us in just a minute. We're going to talk to Jordan Ronan. He's ESPN's NFL Nation Giants reporter. But the reason we're going to have him on is Kayvon Thibodeau played in a preseason game, Oof. and he got – a cut block. One mm-hmm. of the uh, tight ends gave him a little cut block, which, of course, had been part of the NFL forever. And some people thought it was very dirty. He got hurt, and for a li- little bit, it looked like might be a serious injury. Turns out he's going to be out three to four weeks. He'll be back maybe for game two. You saw it. Do you think that hit was dirty? I mean, I rely on smarter NFL minds, and I- I've been following a lot of these guys who played, who are playing the game now. And they're all saying it was valid. You know, my concern, Matt, is we only care about moments like this when someone of significance gets hurt. Uh, and it shouldn't be that way. Like Some plays are dirtier than others yeah. if the player's good. Well, the thing is, unfortunate doesn't mean dirty. And that, that I think, is this case. So, so Jordan Ronan is ESPN the NFL Nation Giants reporter. He's here. So I'll start with this, Jordan. Yep. You're around the Giants all the time. Do they believe this hit was dirty? No, you know, so I asked Brian Dayball after the game. I flat out said, hey, you know, leave it open-ended and say, hey, well, what did you think of the hit? It's kind of a tricky one because it comes in low and it goes at his ankle. And he said, look, look, that's the rules. That's a legal play. You know, like that, that's part of the game. So uh, they – and then I even went into the defensive side of the locker room. I asked Dexter Lawrence, who's one of their starting defensive linemen, and he was like, man, you know. If there's an unwritten rule, nobody told me. Like I don't know about I don't know about that rule that you're not allowed to, you know, cut block and you know as long as you're not engaged with somebody else, right? That's what if it, what about the fact it was a preseason game? Does that make a difference? Okay, so then I talked to Chris Snee, who's a former Giant, probably you know if not the greatest Giants offensive lineman of all time. He's up there, uh, and he told me, okay, so he's a rookie. He cut block once in his professional career in the preseason. It happened to be against Ray Lewis, okay? And it did not go over that well for Chris Snee. <laughs> he told me Ray Lewis ripped him a new one, right? Absolutely, like, just shredded him and tore into him. And then actually even came up to him after the game and had a conversation with him about, hey, young fella, you know, Chris, Chris Snee's a rookie at the time. And he says, you know, this isn't what we do. This is the preseason. You know, we don't have to do these kind of things, especially when you're coming from the side, which is kind of what happened there, right? This wasn't like a a straight-on cut block. This was a guy coming across the formation. Like, we don't do that in the preseason. The preseason is about, you know, getting guys ready for the season and and, and just getting some work in, blah, blah, blah. But the difference here is that you look at it, and Thaddeus Moss is a guy who's trying to make the roster, right? He's not in the same situation as Kayvon Thibodeau. Kayvon Thibodeau is a, is a the fifth overall pick. He's just getting ready for the season. On the other side is Moss, who's trying to make the roster, and that's kind of the, what, kind of what you have sometimes when you have that differential there. This became the narrative, um, but it sort of uh, superseded Daniel Jones playing better. My, my sense, and I think most people thought, you don't sign him to the fifth-year option. You're ready to move on from him. What's the scenario nah. where the Giants don't move on from Daniel Jones? I spoke to people in the organization about this, and they said, look, we have a new regime. We have to see what he is in their system, if he could play, you know, show that he's a high-level quarterback, right? He's never really shown it consistently. So you're not going to guarantee a lot of money. They're they're open if he does well. You know, if he blows up and plays great, they would re-sign him in the middle of the season. They do have the franchise tag to use. Like, if they end up in that situation, that's a problem they would love to have. Right. Because that means Daniel Jones was great. And maybe they don't have to go spend all these assets on trying to find a quarterback next offseason. So this was really just always the obvious move for them because 
he hasn't played at high enough of a level yet. You know, you could blame a thousand other things. His offensive line has been abysmal. He's on his fourth coordinator in four years, third system. Uh, his playmakers have been injured. Think about this for one second. Daniel Jones, since he's been the starter, has never played with a consistently healthy Saquon Barkley. When he had that great year, that wasn't even when Daniel Jones was a starter. Like, he hasn't even had that guy for an extended period of time healthy. You know, so there's a lot of reasons, but until you see it, you're not going to guarantee him that money. And, and otherwise, you end up like the Panthers just did with Sam Darnold. And that was what actually the example that new general manager Joe Shane made not long after he was hired. So, but looming in all this is there is a quarterback class coming next year that some people think has a chance to be historic with like five to seven guys in the first round. Do you think that that's part of the decision to wait is unlike, say, last year where you didn't even have an obvious guy to go in the top of the draft, that next yeah. year there's five to seven guys who could? I don't think it hurts for sure because when you look at Joe Shane and you look at his background, he comes from Buffalo. He wasn't there, I believe, at the time. He, he came right after. But, you know, he's on the – he's Brandon Bean's protege, basically. So what did what did Buffalo do, right? That first year, their quarterback was actually Tyrod Taylor, who's the Giants' backup right now. They, I, I think they even made the playoffs that year, Sean McDermott's first year. They scrapped it together. They were like a scrappy team. No one expected much. They, they – they showed some progress. Then, year two, they drafted Josh Allen, right? So that's kind of where they are. They're, they're kind of on the same blueprint here. So, yeah, I think it definitely factors into the equation that they they understand that the likelihood is they're going to be going to get a quarterback in this upcoming draft next year and that it just so happens it's a good year to be looking for a quarterback, or so it seems. These things change sometimes during the year, but – I don't know about five to seven quarterbacks when all said and done, but if there's three or four, that's still pretty good. That gives them an option, an opportunity to go get one. And if, unless Daniel Jones blows up and plays amazing, the likelihood is they'll have a pretty good draft pick to start with. Hey, Myron, I hope in his three to four, he's including Will Levis. He is, isn't he? He's going <laughs> to do that. I like Will Levis. Actually, right, he, I'm just making sure. I just want to make a, sure he didn't uh, just yeah. cut Will Levis out. He can be in it. He'll, he'll be in it. Uh, I'm kind of of the mindset, I think most people are, that, you know, you don't pay running backs a ton of money. I mean, this is sort of the era we're oh, yeah. in. What does Saquon Barkley have to do to prove to the Giants that he's worth a big contract after this year? Stay healthy, right? I mean, isn't that step number one for Saquon Barkley? I mean, he hasn't been healthy each of the last three years. He's been healthy one fully for one out of four years in his NFL career. I mean, that's been his biggest problem. Now, it helps that he had this off season to, you know, get ready for the season and train for the season. Remember, this point last year, he's still not cleared to play. He's still rehabbing and coming back from a torn ACL. And he's mentioned it before several times this off season, or actually this summer even as well, where he admittedly just didn't have full confidence in his leg last year. Uh, he was playing kind of tentative, and, and you, you saw it. He, I mean, he played last year, but he did not play very well when he did. Then he hurt his foot when he finally felt like he was starting to come back. He stepped on someone's foot, hurt his ankle, actually. Uh, so, But it's all about health with Saquon Barkley. I mean, like he's talented. You could still see the explosion out of him, maybe not what he was when he first came in the league. He lost a little bit, but certainly not enough where you're like, ah, look at this guy slow or not explosive. No, he still has that part of it. So the skills are there. It's a matter of, how, okay, can he stay on the field? 